In the 1980s and 1990s, Italy's Serie A was widely considered the best league in the world. Che venga battuto questo calcio di punizione, piede sulla palla, la specie, parte il tiro, rete, rete, Maradona ha segnato, magnifico calcio di punizione. E lancia Roberto Baggio che ha una grande intuizione, Roberto Baggio punta su Rossi, Roberto Baggio salta anche Rossi, il tiro e il gol, grande azione in contropiede della Juventus. Ancora palla fuori, la conclusione, il gol di Battistuta, gol di Battistuta. But with the new millennium came the rise of the Premier League, Bundesliga, and La Liga. Now it is Serie A who is struggling to keep up. To make matters worse, Due to the coronavirus pandemic, the league is entering a period of uncertainty, and many clubs are on the brink of financial ruin. Yet, reports in recent weeks by the Financial Times suggest help may be on the way. Today, we look at CVC Capital's potential investment in Syria A and ask, what would it mean for the league? So last week, you reported on CVC's interest in investing in Syria A. What do we know so far about their interest? We know that CVC, which is this private equity firm with offices around the world with billions under management, they're in exclusive talks with the body that runs Serie A, Italy's top football league. Murad Ahmed is a sports editor for the Financial Times. Exclusive talks is important because it means that only CVC and Serie A are talking right now. There's nobody else who can try and get in on this deal. Essentially, it's a deal to take a around 20% stake in the league for 2.2 billion euros. But it has all these other elements in it. Effectively, it would create a new company which would have the broadcast rights and media rights to Serie A matches for the next 10 years. And... It would have another element, a stadium infrastructure fund to improve the stadium in Italy. And so they're valuing it at $11 billion over the next decade, essentially. Yeah, 10 to 11 billion is, is what we think they value the league at, which is big money. And it's all quite unusual because we never really thought there was a way of buying a football league in Europe. And this is a kind of an original concept. And that's why it's got a lot of interest, because it upends the business model, the finances of football in a way that we didn't think was possible. So just to be clear, in this deal is broadcast, commercial and stadium investments, all three, like a total package, not just broadcast. Yeah, so it's everything. And it's everything because the way that CVC operates, which has had a long history of operating and buying sports franchises around the world, is they want to own the sport in some way. They want to own the commercial aspects of the sport. They're less bothered about, you know, the rule changes and how that how the sport actually operates. You can do what you want with that. They want to try and take control over the commercial aspects of the sport. It's what they did with Formula One. They owned it lock, stock and barrel. And they could conduct the broadcasting deals that they wanted to do, the commercial deals that they wanted to do, and also get all the benefit and the value from that as well. They're doing it in rugby. They've bought into English Premiership rugby so far. They're trying to do a deal with the Six Nations, Europe's big rugby tournament. They're trying to uh, buy into other rugby assets. We were starting to hear that they're interested in football and why not? It's the most popular sport in the world. It's one of the most valuable. It's an interesting concept to try and buy one of the leagues. You mentioned that they owned Formula One. They owned it from 2006 to 2017. How did that go for them? So for CVC, it went great. They bought it for around a billion, I think. They sold it for eight billion. All of that is profit for them. So they've got a track record of taking a sport and bringing up its value. But 
the value for them. You can judge whether or not you particularly like the Formula One product as it is. Under CBC's management, there were issues with declining television audiences. The product on the track wasn't that exciting or interesting. And that might have been to do with the kind of the complicated nature of F1 politics. But it's certainly the case that not everybody was that happy with CBC's management of F1. It remains to be seen how they would run Serie A. Now, Serie A is clearly an asset that could be worth a lot more than it is in terms of Italian football used, used to be the best in the world. The richest teams, the best players used to play there in the 80s and 90s. That hasn't been there for a long while. That's been superseded by La Liga in Spain, the Premier League in England. So there's a chance of really building it up to be a proper challenger again, sell broadcast rights around the world. You've got Cristiano Ronaldo already playing at Juve, for example. That should be more valuable. Do these commercial deals. So that's what CVC is trying to offer. Serie A desperately in need of money to compete and that increased liquidity to reinvest into the league. It's hard to say whether or not this is a great deal for them, though. Well, I want to talk about that kind of through the eyes of Formula One. A racing team executive said while CVC ran Formula One that they were, quote, raping the sport. So what is kind of their reputation or how do other business people talk about CVC? CVC is known as one of the toughest, hard-nosed private equity firms anywhere in the world. Don't be mistaken by anything other than what they care about is making a profit. They have a huge amount of investors who invest in their fund, and every 10 years they expect to get a good, healthy payout. So they see an opportunity here. They're also very, very savvy operators and can get into meetings and deals that other people just cannot. So they set their sights on rugby. They have managed to get a deal with the Premiership Rugby halfway to a deal with Six Nations, talk to South Africa rugby, talk to New Zealand rugby, talk to world rugby. From a standing start, they've managed to get into the centres of power and across the sport. Before the Serie A deal, they were talking to FIFA about the Club World Cup competition. They also spoke to Real Madrid about their idea of a breakaway global league. They can get into places because they're taken very, very, very seriously in the business world, but they're a private equity firm. And a private equity firm essentially comes in, they try to take an undervalued asset, they will make cost cuts where they can, that means people lose their jobs, they will uh, make it run ruthlessly, efficiently, and they have a good track record of doing that, but there is a human cost attached to that, and that's why you end up with people within F1 who had all of this, they felt like costs were cut short, and a lot of value was stripped out and taken to CBC, and they didn't get to see the benefits. A lot of teams still feel like money went to the top of F1 and didn't spread through the other teams, living hand by mouth. A lot of them failed. The spectacle isn't very good on television as a result. So that's a long way of saying they're really hard negotiators. They're really good at making money. It depends on whether or not you think that the benefits of that outweigh the risks of having an organization as tough and as hard nosed as that being part of the running of your sport. Well, I want to even go a little bit further into that. Alex Webb of Bloomberg wrote back in March when CVC was discussing getting into rugby that teams must be wary of CVC's appetite for debt. And the reason the fund was able to turn $1 billion cash into a profit within two years was by saddling the organization with debt and extracting mm -hmm. a dividend. When it sold its control to Liberty Media later that year, for $8 billion, the value came from its debt pile. So can you kind of just explain what that means to the average person? And we'll kind of get into the concerns about maybe piling Syria A with debt. This is a good and important point. The way that a private equity firm usually works is trying to work out how to make a dividend, how to take money out of the organization and pay the shareholders money from the earnings of, uh, of an organization. A way of being able to pump that up is to raise the debt levels at a company. And they would say partly to invest money into an organization so they have the cash to really up and grow. There's a reason that they're trying to do this sort of thing. 
What's different with the current sports fields, including rugby and including what we hear from Serie A, is that this isn't a debt play. There's no attempt, I think, from everything we hear to add debt to the organisations. This is a strictly an effort to buy equity, buy shares, buy a stake in the organisation. And the way they will make money is if the whole organisation grows the value of the organization grows it makes more money over time and they'll get a proportionate share it's closer to venture capital investing or investing in stocks and shares the idea being that this is a relatively less predatory way of operating because if you make money everybody else involved makes money as well that is not a private equity model of doing things it's it's vastly different And it also is one of the reasons why you're getting some of these sporting organisations who would never, ever consider handing over the commercial rights of their sport to a private equity fund to look more interested in this sort of thing because they see the risk is a lot lower. But once you're in the organisation, once you've got the stake, you can start to call the shot on various different things. So it'd be interesting to really get inside the documentation to see if they could leverage up there later on what's preventing them from doing it at the moment it would seem the cbc wouldn't own everything in the sport they'd only own 20 percent, so they'd probably be blocked from doing so from everybody else but they would certainly have the commercial rights and and that means the business model is being run by an outside organization effectively <laughs> You talk about how this is such a novel concept in terms of buying into a league. Normally, an equity firm or hedge fund might buy just a team, but obviously that's a little bit more risky. So why do you think that they have their eyes set on the league? There are a couple of reasons. One is the way CVC operates. They want scale. So if you buy a team, there's very little that you can actually do beyond that team. You don't own a stake in the league. You own a stake in the team and that grows. They want a really big deal. So the way they think about doing that is to buy competitions outright. And there are precedents for that. Like Formula One, they used to own MotoGP. There are other leagues, sports that you can own outright. Like UFC is owned by a big entertainment and private equity, a combination of of those sorts of corporate groups. We just didn't think it was possible in football because of the way they're set up. They're set up as as essentially a club of members. You know, Serie A is effectively owned by the teams that are playing in it. And I'd always been told that you can't own a football league. But it turns out they've figured out a way of doing that. And the way that they've done that is bundle all the rights into a different company where everybody has a a certain stake in it, which is kind of an interesting new model. And I'm sure other leagues will look at it very closely. The other thing is in the pandemic, even though we're told that the pandemic has got nothing to do with this, right now there's a load of private equity firms, financing outfits out there. All their deal making is dried up and they're looking at under pressure groups who need money now and try and do quick deals at the moment, which will pay off in the long run. So Bundesliga, for example, have been approached by another big fund, Apollo, to essentially a loan that will be repaid over time, but against their broadcasting rights. There's a lot of these groups out there trying to find a way of backing football, backing leads and make money out of it. What's particularly interesting about this is that you would own a stake actually actively in the league. And that, in my mind, hasn't really happened before. So these leagues realize that they need money and they're kind of strapped for money and cash. And these private equity firms realize that they can maybe get in at this time where they wouldn't normally get in, you know, maybe for either cheaper or they're just, these leagues are a little bit more vulnerable and more willing to take their cash than they normally would. That's exactly it. I mean, it's either take the money now or risk going out of business altogether. And that's the calculation that's going through a lot of the clubs. Because effectively, if Serie A doesn't manage to complete its season, you're talking about half a billion euros in losses, which has to be spread across all of the clubs. For a lot of clubs, they'll just go bust. So why not take the money from CVC now which will keep you afloat for the short term. That is the kind of consideration that's going on within Serie A. 
it's definitely one of the considerations that was going on when Apollo approached Bundesliga. It didn't happen the other way around. Apollo approached Bundesliga about lending them money. Bundesliga's up and running, so they're limiting their losses. There'll be a lot of big finance groups out there watching football and seeing the opportunity to get in there at a time that they're distressed, believing that eventually when games get back on and we get full stadiums again, football will continue to be booming in a way that it was previous to the pandemic. So based on current talks, how likely is it that you think this deal goes through or, you know, how would you maybe characterize the talks as they are now and the likelihood going forward? It's a really good question. I would really love to know how the talks are going. So there's got to be a good chance that something's happening because they've decided to go and have this period of exclusivity. They've been taken super seriously. There's six weeks where they have this exclusivity period of, of talking. Paolo Dal Pino, the president of Serie A, is leading the conversations from the Serie A side with his board and they've drawn in four of the club presidents last week to discuss what the initial offer was, including Juventus's Andrea Agnelli, which is one of the most powerful figures in European football, let alone Italian football. The club heads of Lazio and Atalanta were also there and they're slowly going to roll this out to the rest of the league to get their discussion and get their input. CBC have gone super quiet, which tells me everything I need to know about how seriously they're taking it. CBC don't mess around. They don't go into exclusivity periods and put big money on the table if they weren't keen. The question is how serious Serie A is. They have an issue in, they have this broadcast deal which they haven't been able to sell or don't particularly want to sell at the moment. And that is an overarching problem that they've got that they've got to fix because they've got to do some sort of deal along the way. They've got to pick a commercial partner, even if it's a big broadcast group, and they can't seem to agree to do that. So something's got to give somewhere because you do need a big broadcast partner in Italy or you need a commercial partner to push your business forward. The part of the problem in Italian football is everyone's got an opinion. They're invariably, it's a different opinion to the next owner. So it's hard to get agreement. Are you a fan of football today? Then why not support the show and sign up to our new Patreon page? You'll get access to bonus episodes, full interviews, and extra content. Just go on Patreon and search Football Today. Now, back to the episode. One intriguing aspect of CVC's potential investment is the possible creation of an infrastructure fund for clubs. That's because many stadiums in the country are severely outdated. Well, I think obviously the stadium experience differs depending on which ground you go to, on how big a game it is, on a myriad of factors, I suppose. Alistair McKenzie is a Serie A writer and podcaster. Yeah, I mean, on the whole, I think the Italian stadium experience is a bit different from other leagues. The grounds themselves, on the whole, don't have much of a match day experience around them, I would say. You perhaps, I mean, taking the Olympico as an example, which is the stadium I go to most often in Rome, you don't really get much around the ground apart from the old merchandise stand or somewhere to buy scarves or things like that. Once you're in the game, you get a pretty sketchy view of the pitch, to say the least. You're quite far away from the pitch and the standard of food and drinks and so on is, is still very basic. I mean, it's Italian football hasn't really gone gourmet with their, their options in that department. As we'll get into, a lot of them are in need of a lick of paint, to say the least. I mean, there's grounds that really haven't been refurbished since Italia 90 properly on, a, on any sort of large scale. A lot of them are kind of big bowls where there's a running track around the pitch, which explains a lot of the kind of distance between the spectator and what they've paid to go and look at. But I think atmosphere is the main thing they sell themselves on because once you're in it, you do generally find it a great atmosphere. In terms of facilities, 
in terms of going to a modern sports venue, say, to compare with some of the, the ones you might find in the States or in the Premier League, uh, it's like night and day. In Serie A at the moment, only Udinese, Sassuolo, Atalanta, and Juventus have their own stadiums, and the rest are owned by local governments or municipalities. Why do so few clubs have their own stadiums? There's no really short answer to that question, but it does kind of stem back to Italia 90, which was the last major tournament that was hosted in Italy. The 1990 World Cup finals didn't produce that many classic matches. In fact, some would say that the quality of the football didn't quite live up to previous tournaments. But there was no denying the drama or the individual skills on show. And for some of those lucky enough to take part, it was going to change their lives. And that was, again, when the biggest stadium renovation and construction project happened in Italy. And there haven't been any since then. So, for example, San Siro is now world famous for the way it looks with the rings around it, big roof. But, yeah, I mean, the, the price of the work and other side projects that was done for that tournament ended up typically being 84% over budget. So some of the estimates I've seen around that are that it's about a billion euros worth in today's money of over budget. Because what's called CONI, which is the Olympic Committee of Italy, had helped to actually fund a lot of those projects and they are responsible for putting on athletic events amongst other things. They insisted on these athletics tracks being put around the pitch in order to basically allow these stadiums to be used for other events after the, the World Cup itself had taken place. And that's something I guess has now become synonymous with Italian football is seeing these athletics tracks around pitches and people often not really understanding why they're there. There's also an argument that the country didn't really benefit from the timing of this because in 1990 there hadn't really been this move towards large-scale construction of very modern state-of-the-art stadiums, kind of glossy modern stadiums that you see nowadays. So they were kind of building quite at times quite large concrete balls with massive capacities in order to fit as many people in as possible. And then the the building of stadiums around Europe and these more modern stadiums we've got used to now really began in the late 90s with the likes of the Amsterdam Arena in 96, Stade de France in 98. But by that point, obviously, the Italian clubs and the Italian Federation and so on couldn't afford to do any sort of large-scale building projects they've already had their ones. So... A big part of the issue is that all these stadiums are owned by local councils and they obviously had big debts to pay off from the World Cup. And I, I guess the most infamous one is, is the, the Delhi Alpi, which was built for that World Cup and was pretty much universally hated by everybody because it was this huge stadium, had almost 70,000 capacity in Turin used by Juventus, but it only filled up, I would say, I think their average crowd was around 30,000 at the time, so it was always very empty. It was criticised for having terrible sight lines, big running track around it looked terrible. It wasn't a popular stadium, and by the time it was actually torn down in 2008, the running track that had been put around it had barely been used. So it, it was kind of a pointless exercise in many ways as well. So essentially, Italia 90 created this string of very large, very expensive stadiums and created a, a debt that needed paid off. So that explains the past, but why haven't clubs in the modern era been able to build stadiums? When clubs in the modern era have really looked to try and get their own stadium projects off the ground, they've run into walls upon walls of red tape. And this is something that obviously Italy is quite famous for, is the bureaucracy. And that has been the key issue for a number of teams, really, who try and get new stadium projects underway. I mean, Roma have struggled with that more than anyone else in the last 10 years, and I'm sure we'll get onto that. But also the San Siro project, and it's hard to find anywhere that hasn't been an issue. And the length of time it takes to get anything through the bureaucratic system in Italy makes it very difficult and requires an awful lot of patience for, for things to happen. I mean, you know, just today I was I, I read in Gazzetta dello Sport an editorial because the stadiums have become a big talking point again, and and in it they wrote, I quote, our clubs at the moment, the ones that adventure down this path of building a stadium end up prisoners to traps of every kind. Italian bureaucracy is a terrible enemy. 
So it is something that people are very frustrated about. I've read that one suggestion as why there's, you know, such pushback from local councils and local governments is because, you know, obviously they're the landlord kind of in the situation and they want their tenants, being the football club, to stay in their stadium because they invested a lot of money. And therefore, that's kind of why they hold up a lot of these other stadiums for approval, because they want to keep these teams in these stadiums so that they're paying rent, if you will. I, I'm not sure. I mean, obviously, that wouldn't help in terms of the, the kind of head to heads you get between the councils and the clubs. And that is something that they need an agreement on. You know, they need the council to be behind or the region to be behind any new stadium project. Now, clearly, like you say, that would be something that they would have to give up. And there was an interview at the end of last year when uh, the Lazio president, Claudio Lotito, was asked about their stadium project, which has been pretty much on ice for the last 15 years now. And he mentioned the fact that they're having to pay a rent of 4 million euros a year to be able to host games at the Olympico. And if you consider the fact that, that a club of who could do with that money is, is losing that much in rent when instead of having a stadium that would be making them you know twice that at least it's a big difference really but yeah because of the financing costs the maintenance costs that meant that they were then obliged really or pressured into making the rental fees for the clubs that used it a lot higher than to be honest what the quality of the ground that they were getting. So Juventus were desperate to get out of there, really, and, and took the first chance they could, which was in 2006 when the Stadio Olimpico uh, di Torino opened up. And so they went and shared that with Torino until they managed to actually buy the Deli Alpi and therefore eventually build their own stadium. And so what has kind of been the financial impact of them buying their stadium since they opened it up? There's been an awful lot of talk about this quite recently because the event is President Andre Agnelli's just had his 10 year anniversary in that role. And in that time, it's, it's quite staggering the improvements that the club has made off the pitch. Now, the stadium isn't the only thing that's helped them improve their financial situation or, or grow as a club off the pitch. But it's it certainly helps. I mean, the the ground opened in 2011. They now have stadium tours, you know, premium hospitality. Uh, there's a shopping centre. There's a museum. They've even got a, a medical centre at the stadium. And the revenue that the club have posted has tripled in that period between the stadium opening 2011 and last year 2019. It's grown by 201.8%, uh, I read in a report. And if you compare that with the next biggest growths in that period in Serie A, I mean, the next biggest is Napoli, which is 78%. So it, it's allowed them to really pull away from a lot of their competitors. What about the other top teams in Serie A? You mentioned earlier that Roma was struggling for years to get a new stadium. How close are some of those top teams like Milan, Inter, Napoli, Lazio, and Roma to getting their own stadiums? Well, I mean, the, the simple answer is you just never know how close anyone is. I mean, I think Roma thought that they were very close about six years ago, probably. So Roma's stadium has been beset by constant setbacks, pretty much everything you can imagine, delay after delay. Their president, James Pilotta, when he to go over the club, I mean, it was one of his great ambitions was to build this stadium. But now he's looking at selling the club and he's in talks with the Friedkin Group in Texas to actually sell the club. And it looks like if that goes ahead, it will obviously be before he's actually achieved a new stadium. But the bureaucratic obstacles he's come up against have been a nightmare one after the other. There's also been a corruption scandal involved to boot. To frame that in context, I suppose quite how difficult they found it. Palotta expected to have this done by 2017, and now in 2020 they haven't even broken ground on it. But yeah, I mean, Roma aside, the, the one that's hit the headlines this week has been the, the new San Siro project, which has been talked about a lot. And it's looking a bit more positive now. 
that's another one that's been set with various delays, but now two projects have been presented. Now the projects involve keeping the current San Siro as part of a complex, but building a kind of state-of-the-art modern venue next to it. So the two projects, you can have a look at them all online, they look great and they have kind of sports venues and shops and cafes and pitches and lots of greenery and stuff all around it. And the mayor of Milan has spoken fairly warmly about it. He said he liked it. The clubs themselves say that they developed these plans in accordance with the 16 conditions provided by the municipality and the city council in November 2019. So they think they've met all the conditions. We'll have to wait and see really with that what the next step is. Nothing, uh, I'll reiterate again, moves quickly here. You know, I want to kind of talk about how CVC's potential investment kind of factors into all of this. I've heard people say that it could be a potential game changer for Italian infrastructure and Serie A clubs. What's your reaction uh, to CVC's potential investment in regards to stadiums? Yeah, I mean, my first thought was when I read the report, you know, what's the catch? (laughs) I I guess... um, Kind of naturally suspicious by this point that there might be something uh, untoward going on but no i mean it it would be a, a game changer in terms of the financial future of the league i would say but also in terms of the investment funds that they want to build for driving these stadium projects forward i'm still unclear about how that would work in reality in terms of Obviously, investment would help, but that's not necessarily going to help get through all the red tape and the bureaucracy that's that's causing so many holdups. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's very positive news for Serie A. I think it could be something that potentially revolutionises Italian football if, if it is all that it says it is, because this is a country that has a lot of kind of romance attached to its grounds and its fan bases and its clubs um, because of those glory years in the 80s and the 90s but the reality is that over the last period of you know 10-15 years Italian football hasn't been at that same standard that it's set in in those periods and in order to get back there again and, and be competing with the you know, other super clubs and big leagues around Europe, they do need to modernise their grounds. They do need to be able to offer a better match day experience to fans and they need to really be able to put themselves forward as a, as, as a more modern top five league. Murad Ahmed is a sports editor at the Financial Times, and you can follow him for ongoing coverage of CVC's potential investment in Syria A. Alistair McKenzie is a freelance journalist and Syria A expert based in Rome. He is also a co-host of the Lazio Lounge podcast. This episode was produced by John McKenzie. I'm Josh Schneiderweiler, and thanks for listening to Football Today.